is great to, to be back in town. We actually leave again tomorrow. So uh, we have the Australian conference and then uh, I go to Samoa and we're meeting with the president of Samoa and having a big gathering there because C3 has had such a positive impact in the islands apparently and they wanna do an event. And so then we bounce over to Africa for oh, three weeks and then up to Europe for all the conferences that we're holding in churches around there. But I have got to tell you, my most favourite stop is in Sydney at the great mighty Ox, amen. The Oxford Falls people, there's none like them. Uh, tough and hardy pirates, that's what you are. Thank you, Jesus. And God, yeah. God has called us to such a great life. And uh, there's so many things up ahead of us that uh, we need to be equipped for what, what is ahead of us, both the good and the bad. And, uh, and so uh, at present, you are in a series on baptism and uh, I'm part of the team here doing this week. And uh, thank you, Kaylee and Danny for doing all you do, looking after this location. How fabulous are these couple? And I know uh, Pastor Alex and Jessen are doing such a magnificent job. I'm so proud of them. They're in Silverwater this morning dedicating a baby uh, of uh, a couple there. You know, hmm? Yes, them. And uh, so why don't you give Alex and Jessen a big hand just in their absence. We love them. They're doing fabulous. And it's fantastic to, uh, to see what they are accomplishing uh, as the next season in this church uh, comes, comes upon us. Look, we're talking about water baptism because next week, we want to see about 50 people actually do that, get water baptised. So I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, where Paul says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into His death? So I need to explain a couple of things before we go any further on, on this particular reading. Uh, he, is, he is explaining a point of ignorance to the Romans who have been baptised, but now he's explaining what's happened, which is God's way of doing things. Man's way of doing things is to give you a six week training course and then have the experience. Like when the eunuch who was in the chariot that Philip the Evangelist jumped on in the book of Acts and he explained everything about following Jesus and the eunuch said, what does hinder me to be baptised? Well, Philip didn't say a six week training course. That's what's hindering you. You've got to graduate. No, he said, nothing. Let's do it now. And then they get to understand. God gives you the experience and then tells you what it was and it unfolds it to you. We'd like to think that we've got to understand everything and then have the experience, not the way of God. And so he starts explaining to them, this is what's happened. And it, Paul, the apostle, has a very advanced view of what baptism was. It had its origins way back in the Old Testament with a prophet called Elisha, who was asked to go and heal a leper, who was a very famous man, uh, the military general of a foreign nation. But he, had, he, he was a mighty and valiant soldier, the Bible says, but he had leprosy. And his maid, who was one of the captives from Israel, said, oh, if you could only go to the prophet Elisha in my country, he's... He's, he's a crackerjack with the leprosy. He just, you know, can fix you up in no time. And, uh, and Naaman gets inspired, so he goes. And then Elisha comes out and says, well, go and dip in the River Jordan seven times. He says, I got a lot better rivers back at my place. So why would I come and dip in your muddy old Jordan? And anyway, his counsellors advise him, says, look, uh, it's not a hard thing. Don't make it complicated. And so he goes down, dips once, twice, three. Seventh time comes up completely healed of his leprosy. Everybody's going, wow. And, and he says, look, uh, yeah, I'm gonna go back and worship your God. Uh, but um, leprosy was a symbol of sin. Always has been throughout the Bible. So if anybody got leprosy, it was like God's judging you for your sins. And uh, it was considered a, 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 a close companion of an evil person. And, and so it, it originates, the whole idea of baptism originates in that concept of 
When you get baptized in water, it's like a cleansing of your sins. It's a healing of the leprosy. It's a cleansing away of all the evil in your life. And so John the Baptist, which is interesting they didn't call him John the Presbyterian because he was a Baptist. And uh, <laughs> it's amazing how long that denomination's been around, right? And, and anyway, he, he, John the Baptist, he, he was holding his evangelistic meetings down there by the River Jordan. Big tent meeting, rows of chairs, and everybody was coming down. And he had such a seeker friendly message. So loving and gracious. He'd say, you snakes, you vipers, get out of my tent. And he, he'd wipe away a locust leg because that's all he ate. Honey dribbling down. His, he, his clothing was ridiculous. It was a camel hair coat. He had a camel hair and... And that was long beard, rugged, never been anywhere else but the desert, can hardly speak anything. She says, who's warned you guys to come out of here from the rough? Get out of here. But they kept coming. That's how you knew it was a move of God. I mean, they just kept coming and he, he kept preaching. And he said, anybody want to repent from your sins? Put your hand up. Well, that particular day is cousin Jesus. Six months younger than him was in the congregation. Third row from the front. Jesus is sitting there listening to John, and, and he puts his hand up. He says, because John has said, anybody want to give their life to Yahweh? Jesus puts his hand up. He says, you can't do that. You are Yahweh. And <laughs> he, starts, he starts prophesying over him. He says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, okay, um, I want to get baptised. He says, you can't get baptised. I'm not, I'm not worthy to tie your shoelaces. He said, no, I, I, I want to get into this. I want to be baptised. And so he said, all right. And he went down to the river and Jesus got baptised. Now that's a very good reason why any of us who say we're following Jesus should do the very same thing. If he can do it, so can we. And, and, and Jesus said, because John was resisting, he said, no, no, I can't, I can't. And, and Jesus says, you got to do this because it, this is how you fulfill all righteousness. And, and he was alluding to the fact that you've got to completely immerse yourself into what God is calling you to do. But also you need to get cleansed in your life. Now, Jesus had no sins to get cleansed from. So he was rolling into the move of God for that time and agreeing with what God is doing is one of the ways that you're going to find that you will follow Jesus. I mean, he didn't say, oh, John, 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 that water baptism thing, that's old now. That's the old move of God. I have a new one called deliverance and healing. And uh, are we gonna show them what the power of God is? He didn't do any of that. He said, John, that's an old message, that repentance message. My God, yeah, here's one people, God loves you. You know, he sent Jesus into the world. I, I mean, he didn't do any of that. He said, what you're doing, I'm going to start doing. I'm going to first submit myself to it and get with the program, get myself baptised. Then, then he went down the road and he started, he started baptising. And he started preaching the same message, repent, believe. And then some of John's disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, John, who were all hanging around John in his meetings, they started drifting over to the Jesus church. And, uh, and, and some disciples came to John the Baptist and said, hey, hey, John, he's getting a few more than you are now. He said, he's meant to increase. I'm meant to decrease. That's why, why I came. I was here to prepare the way for him. And now he's gonna move into a whole new phase. And he did. But that was, that was one concept of what baptism was, the cleansing away of evil. But now Paul is saying, do you not know that when you got baptised, you died? And often we don't know it because we feel very much alive. But this is good news for you and me because the person who has caused you the most problems in your life is sitting in your seat this morning. <laughs> and it is a good day when that person dies. That's victory, people. Yeah. I mean, if you come with me down to the Monavale Cemetery this morning 
And we find the, the graveyard of a person who had trouble with alcohol. And we, we take a bottle of scotch down there and we, we hold it over the grave. Come on, you like a drink? You know what's going to happen? Nothing. Because he's dead. Doesn't have any power over him anymore. He got set free. But I know that's not the way you want to get set free. You'd like to get set free and stay alive. Well, happily, that is exactly what Paul is saying. So let me read to the end here. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into His death? Therefore, we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that's not talking about your father, it's talking about your old nature. Your old nature got crucified with Christ. The Romans had a particularly gruesome torture or punishment for murderers. It was one of the particular treatments they had wasn't used all the time, but one of them was that they would take the murdered person, the victim, and chain that dead body to the new body, the, the living body of the perpetrator, the murderer. And so that was his punishment, to walk around with a dead body chained to his back and gradually the corruption of the decaying flesh would eat into the living person's flesh and they would die as well. As I said, a gruesome death. Really shouldn't talk about it on Sunday morning, I know, but it's, it's like, this is what, that's a pretty graphic image of what we do if we hold on to our old life, our old nature, trying to live with this new nature. It will corrupt the new nature. If you come here and stand down there and I try and pull you up, that's difficult, but you try to pull me down easy because of the force of that gravity. And, and trying, to, trying to improve your old life can't be done, but that old life will corrupt you. That's why there needs to be a separation from old influences, from old places, from old practices, from old things, so that we cast off the old nature and live in this new life that Jesus has given us. Don't be fooled by somebody selling you a thing about hyper grace that you can live however you want and God still loves you. It's gonna corrupt your spiritual life. There has to become a separation called holiness, called sanctification, called being set apart to the Lord. And that's just letting the old life go. Let it go. It's impossible to follow Jesus without letting it go. And you can let it go in a bathtub next week um, in water baptism or in the sea or wherever you get water. I've baptised people in so many different situations. And you know what? Baptism is like a declaration of dependence. I know we've heard of a declaration of independence. And I'm declaring I'm independent from God. I do what I... No, this is a declaration of saying, I'm going to depend on the Lord. Because just like that guy takes you next week, put you down under the water, you're saying, I'm depending on you to bring me up again. <laughs> I'm trusting you. And that's what you're doing when you say, Lord, I'm putting my life in your hands to go back into the water and die to an old life and to be raised by your hand into a new life. Just as I'm trusting this minister next week to do the same for me. So in the end of this passage that I'm reading here, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be the slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So one of the problems you and I have is that when we have not submitted ourselves to Christ, we are by default submitting to the forces of this world the forces of darkness, the devil, demons, other things and evil forces that will manipulate us. And we find ourselves doing things we wish we didn't do. 
we find ourselves enslaved. Our will, our, our capacity to say, I'm gonna do this, it's, it's compromised. We find we can't actually get ourselves to do the things we want to do because we've been slaves to sin. But then Jesus comes along and He is, because we're not powerful enough to break that force in ourselves. We try, we work hard, but we just can't escape the impulses that are in our flesh that we've inherited all the way down through the human race from Adam. But Jesus came and He is the one force in this universe that is more powerful than the power of sin, the power of death, the power of the devil. And He breaks those chains so that you and I are set free from slavery to sin, following around its impulses. And finally, we get freedom of will. He sets us free. And we now have the freedom to choose to follow Christ. God doesn't force you to follow Him. He doesn't manipulate you. He leaves it to you. And that's what baptism is. I am choosing to be all in. I'm following Christ. I'm burning the boats at the shore. I'm leaving my old life. I'm no longer gonna live like a caterpillar on a log. I'm a butterfly. I'm gonna actually escape the old life. I'm coming into the new in Jesus' mighty Name. And that is what Jesus has done for you. <laughs> you gotta love Him. You gotta thank Him and praise Him and glorify God for sending Him. That's why Jesus came into this world to set you free if you didn't understand what it was. Okay, now, another point. There's so many good points in this, in this message. I mean, you gotta admit, it's, it's really good preaching. And <laughs> the thing is, look, the thing is that baptism, some of you might come from a background where you got sprinkled as a baby. And you think, well, I've been done. I've, I've had my, you know, I've been fixed up, I'm good. Can I, can I suggest to you that baptism, well, I don't even need to suggest this to you because it's a fact. The word baptism doesn't mean sprinkling. It means immersion. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Latin word that got anglicised because the translators didn't want to say it means to dip completely, to immerse, to soak they didn't want to say that because King James, who authorised the version of his Bible, he wasn't baptised, he was sprinkled. And they didn't want to say the head of the Church of England isn't really baptised. He's just a sprinkle. He, he, so they just said, let's avoid any conflict and just say, turn the word bapto into baptism and nobody will know the difference. So that's how, but I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you, did you, you don't get a sprinkling of the Holy Spirit. You don't get a sprinkling of Christianity on your life, like a little bit of salt shaken over your life and carry on living with a bit of church, a bit of, bit of religion here and there, listen to a couple of Christian songs and maybe turn on Hope FM every now and then. And yeah, I got a little sprinkling. No, this is an immersion. This is an immersion into Christ. And there are five of them in the New Testament. And it's always used, the, the, the same words used, baptism. So the whole New Testament is an immersion lifestyle. It's not a, I've got the law out there, the Ten Commandments, and I've got the tabernacle down there, and I kind of go along, and these things are on the outside of me. No, this is me being in Christ and Christ being in me. This is a total embracing of Jesus and a total immersion into Christ. So that, so that when we're singing the song, I surrender all. How cool was that, huh? It's like a, I know some of you were thinking that, wow, this guy could have had another job. He could have. <laughs> he sounds like that old crooner, Dick Martin. What's his name? Rick Martin. <laughs> Dean Martin. He was always drunk on his TV show. <laughs> this is my first drink tonight in my left hand. <laughs> he was terrible. The Rat Pack. We grew up with those guys. Some of you guys don't know what a thing what I'm talking about right now. But when we sing that song, I surrender all. I've seen some people and, and I got to think, you know, really? It's I surrender 
I surrender. You know, just the whole lot. I surrender all. Jesus, I'm letting go my life and I'm giving it all over to Him. You know, when Paul came to Christ, he had a lot of things going for him. Most of us, when we came to Jesus, we were, we were dying, we were in a mess, we had trouble, we had problems. We, oh, I gave it all up to follow Jesus. Well, we didn't give up a lot. Really, it was just a lot of problems. But some people have a lot going for them. And like the guy who ran, you know, um, Chariots of Fire, Eric Liddell, he gave up the Olympics, the possibility of winning for Christ. He gave that up. He, he gave up a career for Christ. And Paul said, look, I had this. I'm of this tribe. I I'm lived a perfectly righteous life, but I gave it all up that I might win Christ because it was between me and Him. And I don't know about you, but if I've ever got some deal that's, that's between me and God, when I go, Lord, I look to you, it's just, it's there. And, and I've got to actually deal with it to keep unbroken communion and, and just let, let it go. Because this baptism thing is not just a once, I did that and I fixed everything up forever. It's like a, a lifestyle that I'm gonna live in Christ and I'm gonna try to deal with those things on a constant basis that might just get in the way. And as you follow Jesus, it's, there are gonna come things. Pilgrim's Progress, the story of one trial here, then a new one there, then a new one here. And all the time we need to refresh that baptism moment. We need to refresh that commitment saying, yeah, I'm, I'm 100% in there. But let me give you these five immersion. The first one is water, which we're talking about today. The second, baptism in the Holy Spirit empowered by the Holy Spirit. The third one, in the church. We're baptised into the church. We're not just attending church, we're actually part of the body, emotionally bonded and joined with other members in that family. And as Chris said before, the one common denominator we could discover in, in looking at all of these friends of ours so many years ago who, you know, God bless them, they they still probably would have some kind of alignment with Jesus, and, but they're not effective or doing great things for God. And it seems like not everybody makes it through. And I would like to think here today that I might bring some, a mixture of inspiration and conviction that, that you would say, I am, I'm gonna be one who crosses the finish line. I'm gonna help build a church. I, I'm putting my hand up to serve the Lord and to, and to actually agree with this water baptism thing that I'm all in. Because that's, that's what it's saying. And then the fourth is I'm baptised in fire. Now I know people who got baptised in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, but actually I'm looking for the fire. Because there's a fire that burns in your belly if you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and if we're on fire about getting a new boat to go fishing, it could get in the way of the fire that actually burns to be in the prayer meeting. There's a fire inside of us that gives us a passion for God. And if I've ever found my, my appetite, my hunger and my desperation, my thirst for the Lord is, is waning, and I'm not really that interested in praying. No, I don't really want to read the Bible. If that's going like that, that's warning bells for me. That's like seeing the police in your rear vision mirror. Oh, you know, you get a feeling, oh, something's up. And I, I need to come back to the Lord and just spend a little time with Him. And I find that being with Him doesn't really satisfy my appetite for Him. It only increases it. So I do a five minute Bible study and three hours later, because I just think this is, this is unbelievable. I'm, I'm discovering new things. But, but let me say this, in a distracted world, this all in baptized concept is very important because too many of us 
we, our mind is never fully present in any one given situation. Most people have a, the, the average attention span for a human being now in the Western world is about nine seconds. Apparently, the attention span of a goldfish is one second longer than ours. <laughs> Welcome to the goldfish bowl. You know when you, somebody's talking to you and at about the eight second mark, you start thinking about something else. You get the glazed over look and then, oh, you hear their voice and now you're looking at them and you can't even remember their name now. And then you're off again. That's called attention span. How long can you listen to a person? And that, you know, you need to be an interesting speaker to hold somebody's attention as well. Don't be boring. And so it's a two-way street of, but, but in a world where, where we got so many distractions, if you could put aside all of those and give yourself fully to be present in the moment with eyes, ears, mental focus on all that, that is part of what being a baptised person is, of having that fire. The last baptism, you won't like this one. It's called a baptism of suffering. It's in the New Testament. You knew you shouldn't have come to church this morning. <laughs> baptism of suffering. You cannot follow Jesus without suffering. In some circles of Christianity, it's like the S word. You can't say it because they don't believe that it's gonna happen, but it does. You cannot follow Jesus without pain. It's gonna happen. It might happen in the church. It might happen on the outside. There'll be critics, there'll be slander, there'll be lies, there'll be betrayals, there'll be letdowns, disappointments, discouragement. Oh, I'll stop there. I can keep on going for a long time. You'll have warfare, you'll have temptations, you'll have uh, just blah days and you'll, you'll be wondering, what am I doing? Why did God let me down? You'll be yelling at God some days, you'll be upset, you'll be angry. You'll have all those normal human experiences as you travel and follow Jesus. But if you've done, if you've said, I'm all in, you will travel through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. You'll travel through the fire and He will be in the middle of it with you. You'll travel through these things and you will come out stronger, more powerful, wiser, and more equipped for the battles ahead than you ever would have before. You can't follow Jesus without it. And I gotta tell you, it is hardly a day of my life where I haven't got something going on that's painful. It's there or it's there. It's, and there's so many areas. And you've still got to be able to function, get up and preach, even though you've got trouble in your life. So that's being called living the overcomer's life. You live above your unresolved problems and yet keep functioning rather than actually dragging you completely down. And that is what God is building, an army that is functional, even though it's under pressure and in the middle of a battle, you keep bringing that sword to bear against the enemy. Ah, this is such good preaching. All right. Ah, oh, one and a half minutes left. That's awesome. I can do a lot within one and a half minutes. I want to talk to you in this last closing segment about, about the all in factor of what baptism means. We've talked about it. It means death to self. It means cleansing from sin. It means following Jesus. It's an immersion. But the all in factor is the one that has always appealed to me. It's the, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Really baptism is that line in the sand. We're saying today is the day. And, and ev everybody recognises that. It's an important, significant moment. And it, it is more of a, a spiritual metaphor. It's, a, it's a, a physical metaphor for a spiritual condition where you've said, I'm going all the way. I'm giving myself to the Lord. I'm not holding back. And this is Paul's admonition to the Romans. He says, look, your salvation has no strings attached. It's not like I'll save you if you give me everything. Jesus said, I'll just save you because I love you. That's it. But Paul says, I urge you by the mercies of God that He has saved you. How about you now take up your cross and follow Him? Lay down your life for Him because He took up His cross and laid down His life for you. And 
And that, that would be my appeal to believers. They've come this far, they got saved. They made a commitment to be in church. But how about just saying, Lord, my life is on the altar. I don't wanna live my agenda for my life or anybody else's except yours. Your will be done in my life. And it's not always easy to obey God. I mean, there are thresholds that we find difficult to get over, like tithing might be one. Getting water baptised could be one. Becoming a connect group leader could be one. Anything. There are, there are just points. There was a, a time in uh, Israel's history when they were slaves for 400 years. Finally, Moses came and he said, we're getting out of here. So the king of Egypt said, no, you're not. You're not going anywhere. But Moses said, yeah, yeah, we are. We're going three days into the wilderness to worship God on the mountain and get instructions for a new nation, to form up a new nation. The king of Egypt said, well, that'll never happen. But judgment started pouring down on his nation. And after about the fifth or sixth judgment, he said, all right, all right, all right. You can go, but don't go very far. Just go a little way out of the city to worship your God. Moses said, no, we've got to go a three-day journey to Mount Sinai. That's where we're going. Death, burial, resurrection, a three-day journey to a new life. And you will find there'll be the seduction, the appeal. Don't go too far with this thing. Ah, oh, yeah, you want to go down to that C3 church. But don't go too far with that. Don't go talking about it around the workplace. Don't be bringing it up at Christmas dinner. You know, don't, don't, don't go too far with this. You know, look, they'll want your money and they'll, they'll be talking about miracles and stuff and the second coming, you know, that, that crazy bunch, crazy bunch down there. They, they don't go too far with it. Don't get too deep. We're going three days journey, buddy. Death, burial, resurrection. Totally new person all the way. That's what Moses said to the king of Egypt. Second, second, you know, like a few more judgments came on, on Egypt. The king said, oh yeah, okay, 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 okay. You, you, you go, but just, just the men, just the guys. He wanted to keep all the slave labour he could with the kids and the women. And Moses said, no, my whole family's going. We're all going. I'm not, we're not leaving anyone behind. We're going, all of us. And then the judgments kept raining. And finally, Moses was called into the king's place and he said, all right, all right, all right, go. Just leave all your livestock here. Leave all your animals here. It's like, okay, you wanna go to church. You wanna be this Christian thing. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. And, and, and you wanna reproduce. You wanna make disciples. You wanna actually plant new churches. You wanna do all this stuff. Okay, okay. But don't take your business down there. You know, leave, leave your livestock. Leave, don't take your money. Don't take your, your, your actual career and your prospects down there. At least... Keep a piece of your, the world, your world in the world. And, and Moses said, I love this thing. He said, not one hoof <laughs> will remain in Egypt. All of our animals, all of our business are coming with us. All of our children, all of our husbands, all of our wives, the whole of our life is going. Three day journey, death, burial, resurrection, <laughs> baptism to the Mount of Sinai in Jesus' Name. And, God, and they left, they got set free. And that is where freedom really is. When we just say, you know what? I'm tired of this half-baked Christianity. Half here, you know, I'm, I'm straddling the fence. That's always a very difficult, painful place to be. I don't know if I'm in or I'm out. Yes and no, oh yeah, we could make the step. Even if you might have been baptized, you might be thinking today, I could possibly do with a rebaptism. I could, you know, just to refresh that commitment to the Lord. But there could be some people here today, you've actually never, never said, Jesus, would you come into my life? Would, I, I want to take the first step of just saying, Lord, I want you in my life. So in a couple of moments, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and we'll pray for you. There could be some people here, who've, you've been away from God. You haven't really been living for the Lord and you're thinking, 
Yeah, I, I need to come. I want you to come back today. I want you to put your hand up when I ask and say, that's me. And there, there could be people who are not sure. You're not sure if you're going to heaven. And I want you to make sure. It's the one thing in life you, you really want to be sure about. So can I ask everybody to just close your eyes across the auditorium? And if that's you, my friend, here this morning, and you've never asked Jesus to come into your life, or you've, you've been away and you, you're coming back, or you're just making sure you're going to heaven, right now, wherever you are, would you put your hand up high? Just raise it high for me. Say, that's me. Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hand. Who else is there? Just raise it high. Say, Pastor, I wanna pray that prayer. I wanna make sure I'm going to heaven. I wanna come back to Christ. I wanna give my life to Jesus here today. Thank you, God, for the opportunity. Okay, can I ask everybody to stand right now? And those of you who raise your hands, please pray this prayer after me, but we're all gonna pray it together. And at the end of the service, those of you who raised your hand, make sure you find somebody, a pastor, and talk to them about continuing to follow Jesus. Can we all pray this prayer? Dear God in heaven, I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life. I ask to be born again. Cleanse me from all sin. Make me your child. Help me follow you. Thank you, God, for saving me. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a great clap offering. Thank you, Lord. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to know more about Jesus, about our church, or if you're in Sydney and would like to plan a visit, head to our website, c3syd.church and find a C3SYD location near you. You can also follow us on Instagram at c3.syd. Subscribe to our messages on YouTube and listen to our podcast too. See you soon.